Hello everyone, this is Shobha from CNS and welcome to the eighth episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, a special series of online interviews with leaders in the Asia Pacific on the theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific, the 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities as we see them. This is also the theme of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, that is APCR SHR 10. For the benefit of our audience, these dialogues will be streamed live on Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and PNS. Just a few quick housekeeping announcements for the viewers before we begin today's dialogue. Audience, please mute yourself and keep your video turned off while the panelists present. Those who are using Zoom platform can type in your comments and questions in the chat box, even as the panelists present and speak, or you can raise your virtual hand and unmute yourself to speak at the end of the dialogue. If you're watching it on Facebook Live, you can leave a comment there. Please keep your questions and comments short and precise so that more people get, can get a chance to have their say. Today's episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues features a panel discussion on sexual and gender-based violence or SGBV as we shorten it during COVID-19 lockdown. We are extremely honored to have with us Dr. Chivon Var from Cambodia, Abigail Erickson or Abby as we call her from Fiji, Ofa Ki Lebuka Gutenbel Liki Liki or we'll just call her Ofa from Tonga and Macha Fornin from Thailand. Dr. Chivon Ward is Executive Director of Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Abby is Program Specialist at UN Women Pacific Region for Ending Violence Against Women. Ofa is Director of Women and Children Crisis Center in Tonga. And Macha Fornin is an ethnic minority, lesbian, feminist, women human rights defender, founder and executive director of Sangsen Anakot Yavachon Development Project. A very warm welcome to all of you. And my first question is to Abigail. Abigail, what has been the situation of SGBV, that is sexual and gender-based violence in the Pacific region before this pandemic, the COVID-19? And also what kind of support services are available to survivors of SGBV in your country. Thank you, Shobha. And I just want to acknowledge my fellow panelists and the organizers of this. It's a real honor to be, um, to be part of this dialogue. I also want to acknowledge that, um, that Afa is um, also here um, on our panel and she is a senior expert and, and um, leader in the women's rights movement here in the Pacific. Um, and so I also want to acknowledge her um, uh, before, I before, I, before I begin. Um, overall, I would say that the situation of violence against women and girls in the Pacific is the same as the situation of violence against women and girls globally, which is we know that men's violence against women and girls is one of the greatest human rights violations and it's a public health crisis globally. We keep hearing this pandemic within a pandemic. Um, and it's true, we already have a, a global health and human rights pandemic. Um, if you take, for example, I saw a recent statistic that in the previous 12 months alone, 243 million women and girls aged 15 to 49 across the world have been subjected to sexual or physical violence by an intimate partner. Um, here in the Pacific, um, we have some of the highest recorded rates of violence against women and girls globally. Um, with roughly two out of three women experiencing sexual or physical violence by a partner. And the Pacific is, is similar to the rest of the re rest of the globe. Um, violence runs across the life, the life cycle um, and you've got women and girls with disabilities, lesbian, bisexual, transgender women often also facing increased risks of violence. The violence is recurrent, it's severe, um, and it impacts women, girls, children, families, and communities at large. I think in terms of the um, support services, which I'll speak briefly about, um, and of course we've got Afa here, who's the director of the Women and Children's Crisis Center um, in Tonga. 
but has also been part of the movement here in the Pacific, very much led by the women's rights movement to develop support services. So, you know, over the last several decades, you've got the Pacific Women's Network Against Violence Against Women and Girls, who have really led on um, developing crisis support services and advocating for improved um, justice, health, and police responses. So you see some very, very good um, crisis services in Fiji, Tonga, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Kiribati, PNG, and other and other countries in the region. However, the Pacific is a is a um, very geographically spread out region, um, and oftentimes those services are not always consistently available across all parts of countries. So you don't always have health, justice, police, and counseling available outside of capital cities. Um, a big part of what UN Women does here in the Pacific is to work closely with the national governments and our civil society partners to really ensure that services, whether it's counseling, health, justice, or police, are moving out of the capital cities of the Pacific Island countries and really getting decentralized into more remote and rural areas, and that those services are survivor-centered and of very high quality. Uh, so how has COVID-19 impacted SGBB in the Pacific region? Has it impacted and in what ways? Yeah, I mean, COVID-19 in short, um, you know, I, in short, I would say, yes, it has impacted um, the issue of violence against women and girls in the region in different ways, of course, um, across the countries, because also the countries are in different stages. Some countries, for example, here in Fiji has um, you know, has 18 confirmed cases and other countries don't have confirmed cases, but are being hit by the, um, the lockdown measures and some of the socioeconomic impacts of COVID. In a context like the Pacific, where you've already got high rates of violence against women and girls, and you couple that with those public health measures of social isolation, quarantine, you know, separating women from people and resources that can help them, that can really create a perfect storm for controlling and violent behaviors um, behind closed doors. And, you know, certainly um, we are hearing in some countries, including here in Fiji, that there is an increase in reporting of domestic violence to the national hotlines. Just recently, there was a press conference held um, in Fiji with the Minister of Women um, and the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Center. And they're reporting that um, not only is there an increase in calls to the domestic violence national uh, helpline, but that actually around close to 50% of women are reporting a correlation between some of the COVID-19 measures and impacts, including um, restrictions of movement and economic strains on family with violence. Um, and we are also hearing from service providers that survivors who are already ongoing um, and receiving services are experiencing escalating um, violence that's more severe and more frequent in nature. So, um, you know, I think that there's no doubt that um, COVID-19, and I know Afa will speak to this as well, because also here in the Pacific, we've got, um, um, you know, tropical cyclones that have compounded um, the situation here, but is certainly having, having an impact. And I think that given the fact that it's both a health crisis as well as a, a, a socioeconomic crisis um, that is, you know, contributing to economic strain and job loss and, and increases in insecurity overall for women um, and, for, and for families, I think in the short to medium term, we can continue to potentially see a trend of more women and girls coming in um, to access services or potentially um, an increase of, of violence overall. So I think this is something that um, is not going away and is, a, is an issue that we will continue to be working very closely with the national governments and our civil, so civil society partners with um, as we already are, but really increasing our efforts um, both on prevention and response to gender-based violence. Okay, thank you, Abigail. We'll, I'll come back to you later again. And now my next question is to Dr. Chivon Var. Uh, Dr. Var, could you please describe the situation of sexual and gender-based violence in Cambodia before the COVID-19 pandemic? And how does this impact sexual and reproductive health services? Over to you. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm very honored to uh, be able to join the this uh, panel important uh, subject during these uh, periods and 
uh, as I said earlier, um, STBV is a uh, human rights and um, STBV happen because of uh, power hierarchies and deep uh, inequalities. And um, uh, uh, about the situations in Cambodia before the, and I think uh, it's not that different from many other parts of um, the world. Um, like WHO said that's one in three women's world in physical and sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. But in, in Cambodia, it's one in five of ever partner Cambodian women uh, reported physical and or sexual um, violence by intimate uh, partners. And 32% uh, uh, of women have ever experienced emotional violence by an intimate uh, partner. So um, as many other countries in the world, uh, intimate partner violence is the most common form of violence faced by uh, Cambodian uh, women. And the health consequences of such violence, as said uh, earlier, can be uh, devastating. Two thirds of women who experience intimate partners reported adverse physical and mental uh, health uh, uh, consequences. And um, other issues also, um, the violence against uh, children. And according to a Cambodian national survey, um, um, the um, sexual abuse before age 18 is also an urgent uh, concern uh, with 4% of females and 5% of male age 18 and 24 reporting at least one experience of sex. And, and I think it's the same as uh, women and, and girls. Uh, women, uh, the common perpetrators of sexual abuse and violence have been um, identified by as husbands, siblings, relatives, neighbors, friends, and intimate uh, partners. And among these uh, young people, 18 to um, 24, who have been uh, abused, 24% of uh, females and 9% of male reported that they have been uh, raped. Um, and this is the um, current uh, situation in, in, in Cambodia for the uh, pandemics. Okay. Uh, has there been any impact uh, of COVID-19 pandemic uh, on uh, this issue in Cambodia? Um, I think um, 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 Cambodia uh, for the COVID, uh, we have about uh, more than uh, uh, confirmed uh, positive cases. The government um, not a mandate um, suggesting and uh, people stay home and practice uh, social distancing. The schools is closed. Uh, most of business um, uh, closed, uh, but it's not as uh, like mandatory uh, stay home. And um, I talk about the, uh, whether there's any um, STBVs and talk to um, our partners and other NGO. Um, here, you know, we uh, do not uh, see any noticeable change in terms of STBV before and uh, during pandemic, uh, except that uh, some organization who providing the uh, shelters uh, to the victim uh, stop uh, receiving um, the uh, opening the shelter for a uh, victim who have uh, not seen as like uh, a life threatening uh, problems. Um, there, uh, you know, of an organization providing a legal uh, service across uh, Cambodia um, telling us that uh, there's no noticeable uh, increase in, in, in the case. But, you know, I, I, I just want to emphasize here, uh, what do this mean to us? Uh, it seems like uh, COVID uh, in Cambodia does not have any impact on uh, STBV. I think, you know, um, we, we, we know the impact because we know that. And uh, the data is uh, coming from uh, two sources, as we all know. So one source could uh, come from uh, surveys and routine uh, survey, national, local survey. And the other is from uh, uh, service uh, statistics. So um, we, we, we haven't done any uh, survey collecting data during this uh, uh, pandemic. And also uh, if uh, the, um, the um, service 
uh, still the same, um, um, not uh, collecting uh, data. So um, we might not see um, any uh, increase or decrease in the uh, demand for STBV um, um, uh, services. So, but this does not mean, uh, I'm sure that uh, this problem uh, does, does not happen uh, in the communities and in the family. Uh, thank you. We will get back to you, come back to you again, um, Trevon. Uh, Ofa, can you please describe the situation on sexual and gender-based violence in Tonga before the pandemic uh, uh, started and also what type of services are available to survivors of such violence? Uh, thank you, Shodna, and uh, Malo Lele. Greetings to all the panelists today and, of course, all the participants. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to take part in this afternoon's uh, panel discussion. Um, your question, Shobna, what was it like before the pandemic? Well, we have a population, uh, and we're, I probably have the smallest population out of the panelists, of about 110,000 people. Um, and the services, the majority of the services in terms of providing uh, support and advocacy uh, response services for uh, survivors of um, sexual and gender-based violence is all um, centered in the main island. So uh, we've got two organizations that are providing uh, counseling services for uh, survivors. We've got one safe house, um, and this is prior to the pandemic, and we have uh, one legal aid service um, and we also have a uh, organization that specifically provides services around sexual uh, re reproductive health and rights, which is our Tonga Family Health Association. I'm with the Women and Children Crisis Center. And so what we did uh, when COVID-19 uh, became, you know, there was alerts going around globally, it, it, it happened quite rapidly. And to be honest, uh, most of uh, the organizations in the Pacific were not ready for it. Um, and not only not ready for it, but we, there were services that we hadn't strengthened yet in terms of referral, national referrals. Only a few countries have national referrals. What else did we know in Tonga? For example, in Tonga, we knew that um, most of our sexual violence cases, which includes uh, child sexual abuse cases against young girls, as well as rape and incest cases, that more than 80% of these cases happen within the home. Uh, we also know that uh, about one in every four women have, has experienced uh, either physical or sexual violence in her lifetime. And we also know that um, the woman in our outer islands, sorry, we also knew that the woman in the outer islands, um, so we have... Uh, five outer islands where women and children did not have direct access to all these services. So while the crisis center has uh, services in two of the outer islands, the legal aid is not present there. The, um, special t the domestic violence unit, special unit within the police is not stationed there. And so uh, a lot of the services that were available prior to us going into lockdown was uh, basically sorry mainly based on the on the main island so because we knew that um, we were actually uh, in hot water that's the best way to describe it because there was a sense of panic that came on because we started to question all the what ifs what is going to happen uh, when lockdown um, takes place and we haven't been able to give clear um, communication to all the, not, not only our current cases in Tonga, but also uh, new cases that will occur during the lockdown. We hadn't, we felt that we, there wasn't sufficient information being communicated to the wider public about how things will happen. So we immediately went into starting things for example, like the online counselling service, uh, which we never provided before in a formal 
um, kind of way. It was just kind of ad hoc. But now we had to go in and set those up. We had to set up all our councillors with mobile phones um, and ensure that they had, um, you know, going into all the privacy around that, the confidentiality, the ethics around that, and actually just taking them through some really fast, rigid training about how to provide services in your home. And I'm talking about homes here that where workers, you know, we've got extended families living with us, so you're not just going back home to a few people. You're going back to a household that's going to be in lockdown with more than eight or ten people in the household. And how do you provide that service as a counsellor, um, taking into consideration all the ethics that you need to follow uh, around counselling? Not only that, also ensuring that the online platform, because of the limited number of resources, we had to use uh, online platforms such as Facebook Messenger, um, create a Facebook page, and create uh, up to three pages so that there wasn't the possibility of someone hacking the system and getting access to the women who were communicating uh, with the centre. So all of this happened in a rush um, we, we all felt panicked, but at the same time, we had to have a sense of calmness in terms of making sure that we knew how to uh, move forward. You know, ensuring that we were communicating with the police that once lockdown occurs, if a woman was trying to access the service, if she physically left her home to escape that violent situation, how was she going to get from point A to point B without being turned back at, at the... Um, at the, the borders where they're checked and without having to tell, you know, her story three or four times, being re-victimised along the way. So there was a lot of things. I'm just trying to take some highlights out of that, but it, it was just a, I think COVID-19 has just taught us about, um, you know, it's this whole new world way, a new way of thinking, new way of working that we've all had to kind of get to grips with quite rapidly um, and with limited resources. And, you know, at the end of the day, once when we go back and evaluate and monitor what we did, I think, um, you know, in hindsight, for many of the countries in the Pacific, it's going to be a huge learning process, but also hopefully uh, being able to share some of the really good practice that, that, that has come out of this. Uh, Ofa Tonga has also faced that double whammy of uh, dealing with Cyclone Harold during uh, a COVID-19 pandemic. How, how did this, we have been reading stories about all the work your centre has been doing, but could you share something about how that impacted and make, made perhaps your work more difficult? Yes, so uh, during the lockdown, when we were in lockdown in Tonga, we were also hit with the tropical cyclone. And unfortunately, one of our centres in the outer islands um, was completely damaged, it was completely destroyed. So that meant, you know, on top of the COVID-19 um, kind of, you know, frustrations that we were, we were experiencing, we had to also experience uh, TC Harold. But in terms of what we know, um, about women and their resilience coming out of cyclones and natural disasters, we knew that uh, it would be the women, despite the lockdown and despite all the impacts on their lives, impacts such as increased domestic work at home because of the lockdown. You know, she is the one who's to do care of all the household duties, take care of the children, take care of sick, sick people, um, make sure that there are increased meals prepared because everybody's staying home now. Um, all these things coming into play and then to be hit with a with a tropical cyclone, we knew straight away that it would be the woman um, who we, you know, the nation would depend on for their resilience to rebuild. And that's exactly what happened. When we did our rapid assessment and sent a team out um, together with Tonga Family Health Association to Awa, that's what we found out. It was the woman who were coming out and ensuring that, you know, they were trying to get the family back to normal, uh, back to normality and, and and all that devastation with houses being destroyed, losing a lot of resources um, belonging to the family. Uh, it was the women in these families who were leading the way in terms of ensuring that, um, you know, they can get through it despite having that double whammy 
Um, and so, you know, and, and when we look at loss of employment, yes, huge loss of employment in terms of COVID-19, but when we look at the statistics in Tonga, the majority of uh, those who have lost employment in the private sector are our women who are in those low-skilled um, jobs, the market, street marketplaces, um, making handicrafts for sale, they completely lost their, 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 their economic um, opportunities, as well as women who had maintenance orders that had to be paid out to them because of uh, um, the, the court orders that have been have been made and, and not followed through because now the um, husband or the father is saying that he can't afford to because he's lost his job and now, you know, that double burden on the woman having to now look for other ways of feeding her children and ensuring that she can keep up um, the demand on a daily basis for her kids. So there's a lot of impact that's happened in terms of, you know, this, both of these issues, the tropical cyclone as well as COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's, it's really been hard hitting on our women, particularly because we know uh, in patriarchal societies, um, all eyes are on her to to uplift the family, to you know ensure that the family is fed, and everything that I've said. So um, the exacerbation of that on violence um, perpetrated against uh, women is you know was seen at the centre. So on, just to finish off, typically in a month we would get 20 to 24 new cases. I'm not talking about our repeat counselling sessions. I'm just talking about our new cases. In the 15-day period of just the lockdown alone, uh, we had 20 cases. So that speaks to that. And the police also reported um, a high number of cases being reported to our police as well. So we have, we can say that you know this that COVID-19 um, has had an impact on uh, sexual and gender-based violence on women and girls in Tonga. Thank you. Uh, now we want to hear from Marcia Fornin. Uh, the situation of sexual and gender-based violence in Thailand before the pandemic, uh, what services are available to survivors, and in what way has COVID-19 impacted those services and uh, the situation in Thailand? Sawadikha. Um, Sawadikha. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Um, I will really strong to say that as the marginalized um, community, we are facing a crisis before the COVID-19, and you may ask why. Um, regard to the situation where I was born, I can give some example. I was remembers as a girl child that born in the farmer family. Our life is rely on land and environmentals. If there is no land, no water, we will die. And we can't think of anyone to help us. Many of my community members lost our land and become a landlord within our own motherland because such a land grabbing issues. Women are forced to follow the gender role and responsibility and carry everyone's stomach. Women are not only face hunger her own, but all family and community members, women also carrying their stomach. I will remember my own childhood with a grow up within the poverty context, being hunger, face domestic violence, and experience of sexual assault. Nothing that I can dream of but education. I will remember at a girl shy at the age of nine, I started to work at a child labor that made me earn one dollar a day in the weekends so that I can have some money in my hand to go to school when the government are failed to providing free education at that time. At a go shy, I remember how my mom sufferings, even she can be divorced from the man that's abused her, but discrimination and violation and harassment still remains by community members who felt that something might be wrong with the woman who have self-determination and free from men. My mom faced a big discrimination and I see it in my eye 
However, what I acknowledge, all the women uh, have her own agency and she's strong to fight by her own feet. At the age of 14, I remember that I could go into the school during the period because I don't have the money to buy the pass. Even this has happened also in Thailand. Still now it's happened. I remember I was three adults because the only dreams with the future of education was impossible when I finished the primary school. My mom told me that we are too poor to afford go education. Why don't you go to the big city to earn the money like other of my sister? I have seven siblings and all of my siblings are, have only a, um, a primary school education. I remember that how hard to fight to walk nine kilometers, a total of 18 kilometers a day to going to the school for the one year long that I cannot board a bicycle. And then I got a bicycle in the long vacation. I went to work in Bangkok in the age of 13 and then I can board a bicycle. As a lesbian, and I belonging to LGBTIQ community, we are scared to go into the hospital or get any services from the government because homophobics and sexual discriminations is really impacts to the services that the provider giving to us. We scared that we gonna get the inequality treatments when they not care about our human rights. I am lucky that I want my education, that I surviving from the hungers and surviving from the poverty, being sexual assault surviving, still alive in the society that rooted with the patriarchy, heteronormativity and capitalist. The society that rooted with that is hunting women bodies and our vagina. In any crisis, we are facing the most violation because our institution was broken, but not militarily, not patriarchy, not capitalists. They are so strong and they suck in our body. All my experience reflected a million of go shy, a million of young women a million of women who are facing poverty, discrimination, and violation based on our ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and sexual orientation. And the no one left behind principles is very important. However, our governments and a lot of stakeholders are failed to following that principle Women and girls are vulnerable, especially during the crisis. When the COVID-19 hit the indigenous community that I'm working with, only a half month, the community ran out of food, unable to access to necessary information because it's not translation into the indigenous languages. And they not understand, they not speak Thai. They're scared. They had no material to protect them. It's no mask there, no one giving for them. And the more importantly, the indigenous community that I am working with are also hand holding stateless status. Any services from the government that you will get, at least you need to, you need to present the ID card with the millions of millions of people in Thailand don't have the ID card, including the stateless people, migrant workers, and undocumented refugees. And the COVID-19 is just the other crisis that showing that we are in the society that inequality impact the marginalized people the most, and we are not the priority 
the government uh, failed to protect us. In terms of what the government already providing, it's similar with the other country. All the government saying that they are trying their hard to providing anything in need for the people. But what I want to say is that it's inaccessible. I can say clearly, for example, indigenous community, indigenous people who are not speak Thai, how can they access to the taste of the COVID when all the providers are not speak indigenous languages? And the health and services in Thailand is free. However, there is restrictions based on the ID card, as I say in the beginnings. Indigenous community are unable to access to the information because they not speak languages. Settled people are scared that they will not equally treat because they don't have the ID card. And it's also the issue of migrant workers in Thailand from Cambodia, from Myanmar, from ethnic minority of Myanmar. They are scared that they will not equally access to the treatment if they get uh, infected from the COVID-19. So my story is hard enough. However, we could see what happened now in Thailand. The ordinary people like us are stand to support each other because the government failed to respond to the need of the people. I will stop this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have a question for all the panelists. We can call it the second round of the panel discussion. Uh, and uh, the question can be answered perhaps in the same order as uh, you all spoke earlier, uh, that will the rise in sexual and gender-based violence during the COVID-19 pandemic impact progress on the SDG goals around sexual and reproductive health and gender equality? Uh, can you please briefly answer this question? Uh, we can start with Abigail. Um, thank you very much, um, and thank you to the other panelists for um, for their answers to the first questions. Um, it's really making me think very much. Um, look, I think that we know that around the world, um, with the 2030 Sustainable Development um, Goal Agenda, it, gov national governments made it clear that there cannot be sustainable development without addressing gender inequality and having systematic gender mainstreaming um, throughout the entire development agenda. And there has been progress. You know, we're about a decade away now. Um, there has been progress, but there's still significant challenges that remain. Um, and we know that if we do not address the central driver of gender inequality, violence and discrimination, then we're not just gonna not meet SDG five, but we're also not going to deliver on the entire um, uh, sustainable development agenda. At this moment, I just want to, in the midst of what feels like such a trying time globally, I am really hoping that, as, as Afa was alluding to earlier, um, in terms of a bit of a wake-up call, in terms of where we're at with our national systems for response or other aspects of gender-based violence at country or regional or national or, or global levels, that this is a wake-up call as well for every country. Um, and that the attention and the money and the resources and um, the political will that needs to be put into addressing violence against women and girls can be totally unveiled against the backdrop of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, because as the other panelists um, and Macha has said, it is impacting those who are most vulnerable. Um, and I, I, I want to be optimistic and I want to be hopeful that when you ask the question about, you know, will this impact progress? I really hope that we, when we look back 10 years from now on this moment in time, that we will say, yes, it did impact the progress, but it did so positively. It galvanized countries, it galvanized nations, um, it recognized what civil society and women's rights groups and other um, human, women's human rights defenders have been saying, which is we need equality, we need to have sustainable development, and it is high time that governments, development partners, civil society put all their attention 
and their efforts into addressing violence against women and girls. I remember going to a conference um, in February in Australia, and it was right around the time that that COVID was was emerging. And um, of, you know, and of course, there was just so much there there is as it should be. It's a global pandemic. So much attention, so much focus on how to address this. And I just remember you know, speaking on this panel and thinking violence against women and girls is a global health pandemic. It is a global human rights violation. Can we put every ounce of energy, attention and resources as well into addressing this? Um, I wish I wish that that will happen. And I hope that when we look back 10 years on this, on this, uh, you know, on this call, that we will have seen positive progress. Okay. Uh, thank you. Dr. Ward, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, um, um, thank you very much. And I agree uh, with uh, we, uh, the uh, answer with this. That is, yeah. And I think the, the impact um, of this uh, pandemics on uh, in the SGDV uh, on SDG, it's, it depends on um, the world and depend on uh, the response to the uh, pandemics. And we have learned and we have uh, discussed and um, you know, we learn know how to um, get together and respond uh, to the issue. Uh, even without STBV, if uh, it's uh, going um, to be continue uh, the status quo of the issue, it surely uh, impact the SDG goals, um, even without the uh, pandemic. Um, and, and as we all know, uh, SGBV uh, will impact on the decisions of, on the use of contraceptive, on whether to seek safe abortions, on whether to seek care related to um, uh, sexual and reproductive health. So the impact decision would uh, result in unwanted pregnancy, in um, safe, uh, unsafe abortions, and increase in incidence of STI, HIV, AIDS. And I think um, um, the best uh, evidence on uh, whether the, uh, um, the uh, SGBVs uh, during the pandemic would uh, impact the progress of SDGs or not, I, uh, the best evidence is uh, from the uh, Guttmacher uh, Institute. Um, they released the, um, uh, the studies and the researcher of the study collect data from 132 low and middle income countries covering 1.6 billion women of reproductive age and estimate how sexual and reproductive health outcome could change uh, with the most the modest decline of 10 percent in access uh, to care uh, you know at, at you know, the reproductive health association of cambodia uh, we providing clinical service and during uh, this uh, quarter, we see a decline in 20% of uh, clients coming to um, the, uh, our network of uh, clinics. So uh, in this uh, uh, Good Marker Institute study, um, they estimate only a 10% uh, decrease in access to care. And that would uh, you know, uh, create um, a lot of uh, negative uh, impact like uh, unintended pregnancies, unsafe abortions, and maternal and newborn death. Um, the report said that like a 10% proportional decline in short and long-term reversible contraceptive use an additional 49 million women in unmet need for modern contraceptive in low and middle income countries and additional 50 million unintended uh, pregnancy. So this, uh, as I said earlier, would lead to uh, more unsafe abortions and other negative uh, outcomes. A, just a 10% decline in patients of pregnancy related newborn health care would result in an additional 1.7 million women who give birth and an additional 2.6 million uh, newborns would uh, experience implications and not receive the care they need. So uh, this 10% decline would result in an additional 28,000 maternal deaths and 168,000 newborn deaths. And I think that you know, um, this, uh, this uh, impact, you know, if the country 
uh, lockdowns or treat abortion as a non-essential uh, service, that also would lead to increase in unsafe abortion and additional uh, maternal, maternal deaths. That's all for me. Thank you. Ofa, we want to hear from you briefly, yes. Yes, Ofa. Please unmute yourself, Ofa. You are yeah, sorry, just uh, briefly from me. Um, yes, yes I, I would uh, agree with what has been said so far and uh, just reiterating the fact that this, this is a wake-up call. And what, it's, what it has shown us is the gaps and what we need to ensure that we get right, um, almost on an, you know, an urgent kind of call. Um, so in terms of not having uh, you know, countries in the Pacific that we don't have the referral pathway um, set in stone, we need to do that now. Because you know, we're hearing rep reports coming out of the WHO that there's going to be another um, cycle of COVID-19 and it may be worse than what we're experiencing now. So in this gap that we have now, we really need to um, pull our resources together and the political will needs to be there. And learning from what is happening now that that, that is actually um, setting us back and setting barriers and challenges for women. For example, the, there's an emergency fund in Tonga for um, people who have lost jobs, or access to employment during the lockdown and during COVID-19, but it fails to recognise that in the pro process application itself, you have to show a bank account. And most women in, um, you know, uh, store, street side uh, store sellers and market vendors and handicraft makers, they don't own a bank account. And so that is a barrier straight off. And then they can't access um, that emergency support. So when we talk about gender equality, we, we really need to dig deep and look at what has happened during this period of COVID and what can we do better and learn from that and move forward. Um, I agree with the, the non-essential services for all the uh, reproductive um, sexual health that women and girls need to access, as well as having hygiene kits at school for girls and that it's not um, that it, you know that, that government provides this because a lot of girls before the pandemic were missing school anyway because of having their menstrual periods, and now with the the hike in the call for um, hygienic practices at school, we need to ensure that our girls and in our schools have safe access to those um, resources. And also, just lastly, for me, uh, we need to to look at a safe way of collecting data and information about the impact of COVID-19 on our women and girls. And we can't just go out there and send researchers out in the field who have no experience at all in terms of dealing with survivors of um, sexual and gender-based violence, because we can exacerbate that violence again ourselves and re-victimize them, which everyone knows on here. But I think it's just important that we reiterate that. Thank you. Thank you. Marcia, a quick uh, brief comment from you. Yes. Um, I could say that, you know, like even without COVID, what we really need to achieve in terms of sexual reproductive health and rights is one, access to abortion for all women in every country. Because one in four of the women are need that. But this is in the 2020, we are still unable to access safe abortion and it's illegal in many countries. Second, students in the school still don't study about the sick comprehensive sex education and not teaching at all about LGBTIQ rights. And that's why a rising of the um, sexual and gender-based violence in the school is happened. In Thailand now, that is five teacher raped one student for over a year. And that's why we think this is need to be done. Even have the COVID-19, it also need to be done. The sex workers is still illegal in many contexts. The sex worker is still criminalized in many contexts. And we need to protect that, the sex worker as they also, the workers, they need the law to protect it. Migrant worker women are everywhere in the world. And the society are failed to protect that migrant worker women. And they also face a domestic violence and the law in the third country, the second country do not protect them, them equally. 
how can we are in this century uh, still a million of million people are stateless and not recognized as a citizen in any country in the world? How can we stay in the society that LGBTIQ I have no law to protect them? Same gender recognition is impossible in many countries. In the whole Asia, only Taiwan, that LGBTIQ can marry. This is half of populations, and we cannot marry, and we have no law to protect us. Reps, corrective reps, is still high. One in third of the women is facing rape, physical abuse by their own close environmentals. And in Thailand, we actually, the number is higher than that. In order to achieve um, SDGs, the goal number five, all of that need to reflect it in the legal framework, in the practice, and in the mindsets, and in the belief of all the society that we are, need to change the system that oppresses the women. And is it the time? COVID-19 show us that you cannot use the COVID-19 epidemic to stop, to make the progress of gender-based violence. And we need that happen now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go on to the question and answer session, uh, just one last question from our, or rather a comment from our panelists. Can you please give one recommendation which you would like the government to give to the government that as they plan their exit strategies from COVID-19 pandemic to get back on track to end all forms of sexual and gender-based violence? One recommendation to the government, starting from Abigail and moving on to the rest of the panelists, please. Only one recommendation? <laughs> you are um, just short of time, but I you know, I know, I'm, I'm totally kidding. If you could, please, if you could I, just shorten it, that's all. Because yeah, I, I'll, I can say it all in one. I mean, I think that um, that for national governments who are grappling now with the COVID-19 health and socioeconomic um, uh, response plans, um, a, you know, very specific measures um, for prevention and response to violence against all women and girls must be part and parcel of those national response plans with budget against it for prioritization investment in essential services, um, including that those services um, can reach every last women and girls, that there's significant investment in primary prevention of violence, um, and really shifting the social norms um, and the attitudes and beliefs that drive violence um, and really ensuring that women and girls are part of those broader social protection plans um, and survivors of violence are part of those social protection plans that are gonna be so critical um, in the recovery process. Um, but I think that it's, it's really, for me, it comes down to the political will, which is demonstrated through those national action plans through, for, with specific measures to address violence against women and girls, and then budget allocated to that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barr? Yes, Dr. Barr, would you like to give your recommendation to the government? Yes. I need to unmute myself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, 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 in Cambodia, uh, we, uh, we have like uh, law um, policies, strategy, uh, program of action related to uh, STBV. So uh, my recommendation would be um, the uh, continue to uh, improve and improve the capacities of uh, relevant, relevant implementer so that they are able to implement those law policies and program of action and improve coordination uh, among the uh, sectors and also within a, a sectors for, at the national and sub-national uh, uh, level. This is a, a general uh, recommendation, but uh, during this um, COVID uh, the pandemics, I think uh, when addressing the and all of us need to uh, apply an intersectional approach and gender equitable response to the uh, COVID-19 uh, measures. And as I said earlier, also support the development of uh, and spread universal violence prevention through uh, traditional and social uh, medias. And uh, we need to uh, increase our resource and continuity of care and life-saving uh, supports and of course, you know, routinely collect a second age is a great data to conduct each other and the issues uh, analysis. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ofa, one yeah, Just one, one yeah. recommendation from me would be um, now, right now, we, we, while we have this window of opportunity, uh, government to work closely with women's rights uh, organisations on the ground with, with expertise in SGBV, um, and I underline that again, expertise in SGBV and uh, gender equality, human rights framework, all of that, that they work closely with the women's organisations and experts on the ground to collect information safely on the impact of COVID-19 on women in terms of physical violence on all women and girls and sexual violence on all women and girls. We need to collect that information in the safest possible way uh, within all the boundaries of the ethics that we um, work uh, accordingly to. And from then, then we go straight into action plans and budgets and ensure that we, next time this comes around and hits us um, more so, we are ready and we are prepared. Thank you. M Macho. As the feminist, I feel heartily to begging from the military governments in terms of, you know, to serve the women and LGBTIQ. However, my recommendation is in Thailand, we need to reform the constitution that creates such a problematic in Thailand. And we have no women representation at all level. And as you see, you know, their team is all the men. They influenced it by military mindset and their very strong patriarchal system. So I couldn't see that they will respond to gender-based violence without the women. So I urge the Thai governments to get the women representation at all level and listen to the voice of the women and listen to what the women need and serve us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now we move on to the question and answer session. And uh, the panelists have made it such an enriching dialogue today that we already have a lot many questions and we may exceed the time limit for uh, today's dialogue. So please stay on because it's because of you we are getting so many questions. But uh, I, I still invite the listeners for their comments and questions. And if you are using the Zoom platform, please type in your questions and uh, comment in the chat box, which you must be seeing on your screen. And if you wish to speak, unmute yourself and then ask your question or raise the virtual hand. Uh, but I'm asked already, we have a lot many questions. So the first question is from Angad Singh uh, from International Institute for Population Sciences. And uh, the question I think is directed to Dr. Chivan Var. Uh, you spoke, uh, Dr. Var, you spoke of emotional violence. And that is something which is often neglected because you can see the scars of physical violence emotional violence very often gets goes unnoticed. So Angad Singh wants to know what are the consequences of COVID-19 on the mental health uh, uh, of, uh, of women per se and other genders? Um, 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 thank you. Um, uh, and uh, um, of course, you know, um, uh, uh, the violence, uh, emotional uh, violence is uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, violence among the uh, other forms of uh, STB, STBV uh, violence. And as I uh, stated uh, earlier, um, people who have been uh, receiving, uh, getting uh, emotional uh, violence, uh, this uh, translated into um, uh, physical uh, and um, um, emotional um, uh, problem. So um, uh, I think we need to understand the simple uh, language of emotional uh, violent example of threatenings and uh, say something that uh, make the uh, person uh, fearful, um, threatening that uh, they will be deprived from food or from uh, shelter. So, um, or even uh, to uh, and not allow um, the uh, person to uh, make decisions as um, they want. So um, this, you know, translate in, 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 in from a sexual and reproductive health uh, perspective. So um, this uh, prevents or uh, girls or the victim uh, preventing them from uh, making 
uh, their free uh, decisions and uh, choice on uh, their life. Uh, and, and, and in this case, uh, it could be uh, impact um, them, uh, deprive them from making the decisions about whether to go and seek for service uh, contraceptive if they are pregnant. They are not sure, uh, they cannot decide for themselves uh, whether they uh, go to seek um, uh, abortion. Um, uh, so um, it, the health consequence uh, from emotional uh, uh, violence is, uh, uh, is very uh, prevalent. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Mizanu Jewel from Association of Medical Doctors of Asia in Bangladesh. Uh, Ms. Anul wants to know, is there any planning and strategy for the elderly in Bangladesh and elsewhere in the context of violence and abuse during COVID-19? Uh, Abigail, would you like to take that up? Or, and other panelists also can answer if they want to. Yes. Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the, did you say Bangladesh? Yes, this, this person is from Bangladesh. And so he wants to know any planning and strategy for the elderly mm. in Bangladesh. And I think that would apply to elsewhere as well. Yes, certainly. Um, I mean, I, I, in my current role, I cover the, the countries in the Pacific. So I'm not overseeing um, responses from, you know, UN Women's Ending Violence um, point of view in, in terms of specifically around Bangladesh. But, you know, of course, the elderly um, are one of the most hardest hit um, populations of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I think that there have been, um, you know, very important public health measures that have been put into place um, and social measures that have been put into place to help protect the elderly across many countries. Um, you know, so for example, you see, you know, certain shopping hours um, for, you know, for elderly people and social isolation measures that are meant to really protect um, the elderly population. Here in the Pacific, we've got um, through the World Health Organization um, incident management team that's working in cooperation with the different UN agencies. There is work happening t around psychosocial mental health and psychosocial support for, um, for the elderly, um, really very proactively taking into account um, you know, the need, you know, the, the psychosocial um, support needs that um, the elderly population have and need here in the Pacific. Um, I don't know, perhaps if, um, if Afa, if you want to add anything specific to how um, Tonga is, is supporting, um, you know, the, the elderly population. Yes, Ofa, please. Ofa, please unmute yourself. Um, we have cluster systems in Tonga, which I'm sure other countries are familiar with. Um, we've got the safety and protection cluster, and we have um, uh, persons living with disabilities, um, the LGBTQI uh, in others' community, um, the GBV, um, and also uh, the elderly, um, all under that cluster. And we do have an, a national organization that specifically provides services for the elderly. Um, definitely, they were impacted during COVID-19, in particular those who are, are living on their own or are living with very young children. Um, and most of these um, elderly people have adult children living overseas and working overseas and leaving their uh, children behind with the grandparents. So there is some very dire straight situations and we don't have all the information, but it was reported back to the cluster system that um, they were heavily impacted during COVID-19. Thank you. The Would lockdown. The, thank you. Would the other panelists like to add something? Yes, can I add a little bit? Um, um, a few days ago, there is a network working with elderly people and they write their statements and write the issue of one, the elderly people uh, have no income during the lockdown. Um, they are unable to get uh, to access to any money from the government. Even now, the Thai government are providing already 2 million people, but elderly is the one who left behind. Um, 
there are risk of uh, impact to the COVID-19, but the government don't have any positive measure in terms of protection elderly. Um, they also face the domestic violence and they ask, uh, they urge the government to ensure that uh, there is the positive measure in terms of uh, solving uh, and prevention of domestic violence and, you know, access to protections in terms of violence. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Liloa Asasa from Samoa Family Health Association. And uh, she wants to know if there is any good methodology to use to cope with sexual and gender-based violence during a crisis. Uh, Ofa, would you like to... Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, is there any good methodology uh, which, we can, which can be used to cope with sexual and gender-based violence? Any methodology or any way you can suggest? Of course, you must be using that. You were, you were talking of online tools which you use during crisis and maybe... You can oh, right. Um, so this is what we learned along the way because it hit us, like I said, um, almost immediately. Um, the first thing we did, because I'm just reading, sorry, I'm also reading comments that are coming in on the chat. I guess one of the methodologies I can talk to is that immediately uh, we talked about our our response team um, calling and making contact to our client list. Um, so these are client lists of survivors, um, and in particular, starting with the medium to risk uh, clients on our list, just to talk them through about what the lockdown will mean um, and what it would look like, possibly look like, um, i.e. not being able to leave the home, and also talking them through a safety plan. Um, in the event that something would happen. Now, as the lockdown occurred, we provided uh, a toll-free number that they could call if anything happened. We also um, set up the online counselling uh, format, which they could also um, come through. And um, all our uh, counsellors were equipped with telephone, mobile phones, and we put those mobile phone numbers out on, um, on our Facebook page so that they could, uh, because Tonga is a small population, um, a lot of people are related to each other. So we had to ensure that we had the list of the counselors' names, the mobile phones that were provided to them with the phone numbers on Facebook so that um, the survivor could select who she could call to and ensure that it wasn't a relative or someone that had a conflict of interest that she was making communication with. Now, after the lockdown, the counsellor advocates again made contact in the safest, safest way possible, whether it was by telephone, a home visit, or to the um, rapid assessments that were happening with Tonga Fem in partnership with Tonga Family Health Association to ensure that these women could talk about the experiences. Uh, was the violence exacerbated during this uh, lockdown period? What types of violence were they seeing? And I agree with the doctor. A lot of emotional violence, coercive control, that has been documented um, in terms of talking directly with your, and I think the safest way, um, because we're all learning how to do this, is to get in touch with your, your clientele first, your client base of survivors, get in touch with them first, because they already trust you, they've really come to your service for help, and so talking to their counsellor um, uh, you know, alleviates all that worry and, and hesitation about who am I sharing this information with. And so we've been documenting uh, those experiences during COVID-19 and definitely a whole lot of coercive control um, uh, you know, examples that have been given through that collection of information alone. Okay, thank you. And I think that answers to a large extent uh, the question from Kamla Upreti and Doris Pulahi who wanted to know what is the safest way of collecting information of sexual and gender-based violence in the pandemic. I think, Opa, you have talked about that just now. And uh, Doris also wanted to know if some countries have already engaged in collecting data on SGBV, uh, considering ethics and safety measures. And uh, Kamla wanted to know if there is any case which has been resolved in this pandemic and what was the procedure for that. So would you like to add something, Opa? I think you have basically answer. Okay. Um, I'll just give a quick example. So during the lockdown, um, there was a situation where a woman was living in both uh, physical, uh, sexual and uh, mental 
uh, forms of violence. Um, it was just herself and her husband, so there was no one else in the household. Uh, she was experiencing this from a day-to-day -day basis, and it actually was increased um, uh, due to her uh, husband uh, being an alleged uh, drug user, um, trafficker as well. And so the, the restriction of him not being able to leave the home um, and being part of that, um, uh, that, that drug kind of um, uh, work that he's involved in, of course, he let all of that out on the wife um, through all his power and, of course, privilege that we've all talked about. Now, what happened was no one knew that this was happening to the woman until day 11, and we had 15 days of lockdown. And the only reason why it was known was because the landlord had decided to walk over and uh, ask about the rent. Um, and the landlord actually wasn't allowed to do that, but I, I guess in his desperateness, he went to seek the rent. And when he approached the house, he actually walked in to a situation where she was experiencing uh, those forms of violence that I was talking about. And so he made contact with the police. Now, the police uh, were contacted at about 8.30 to 9 in the morning. Um, they didn't show up. Uh, up until 1 p.m. that day, the police hadn't shown up. And so the landlord then made contact with um, uh, the probation officers at the court as well as us. Uh, and then we had to move in and ensure the safety of our workers to ensure that they were practicing all the hygiene methods while they were making contact with this woman and ensuring her safe exit out of that house during lockdown and transferring her to um, the safe house. So I guess that's, uh, um, that's uh, uh, one of the ways that we, we assisted a, a case during COVID-19, but also she has um, talked about her experiences on those first 11 days, which we have documented. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Fahad Ali Kayani from Pakistan. And Fahad says that during the pandemic and lo lockdown, over 700 cases of gender-based violence have been registered only in one, in one month period uh, in their country. And the women remain the most vulnerable. And it gets difficult to reach out to such women. Uh, uh, please guide how to reach them with meaningful information as many of the masses don't have social media access. And how can young people get SRS services during lockdown? And we have a similar question from Mona Yadav from India, who says, in India, there is a lot of panic around issues of hunger, especially to the disadvantaged people, as we see reports coming in the media. And women are especially at high risk of domestic violence. But due to limitation in technology, especially for women in India, how can we help map women in need of support? Uh, of the, uh, from domestic violence. The question is open to all panelists, whoever. Yeah. The, yes. Um, I may respond uh, yes. on of that question. For yes. example, um, um, the, uh, the state-led community that I'm working with and uh, a lot of young people uh, move out from their community to study in the city and many of them are LGBTIQ. During the lockdown, they went back home and they are faced um, domestic violence as well, why the family are not accepted their sexual, orienta sexual orientation and gender identities. So re they reach out to us. What we did is we starting to um, working in two level. The one level, um, why the domestic violence and gender-based violence do not operate in Thailand during the COVID-19, because the government not giving the priority for this matter. And the power of the government is very really top down, meaning that in very high level, if there is no policy in place, nothing gonna happen in the ground. So we need to urge the government to have the policy to respond to that. For example, access to abortion. Now we are, have the group who are working toward uh, access to abortion, uh, prepare the, the letter to the government that ask them to ensure that the young people or the women who are pregnant during this time are possible to access to the pill to access to the safe abortion. When a lot of um, uh, hospital and sector that providing are closed or shut down during the uh, lockdown. So this government need to speak out that, you know, they will have the policy respond to that. But in the community level, 
when nothing happened now is the young people who return home who understand the languages who understand what's going on we empower them we working with them to collecting the data how many people in that community how many of them are facing domestic violence and what they need and after that you know we are possible to write a fundraising campaign to support more than 200 of them so this is example that participation from the community ask what they want allow them to working you know even in such a difficult situation maybe is the key especially if they are you know lgbtiq they we have a very specific need and we need to ensure that we also protected by any sector that we are participation thank you thank you also you would like to add you have been using some uh, methodology and some uh, methods for that you have typed it in the chat box but could you like <laughs> Could you please spell it out? I'll try to save time. <laughs> no, no, very important because it has to be told in any. It's very important yeah. point. One of the tools um, that, of course, most of our countries will be familiar with that has a wide reach is radio. Um, it reaches the most uh, rural areas, but also uh, where we don't have the frequency reaching that um, far, I think this is where we really need to rely on our people on the ground and start building these um, community focal points. Um, and I guess there are partners here who have examples of how that can be built. Um, but when you have community focal points in those most rural areas, uh, they act as your uh, communicator of all these awareness messages, as well as communicating back to the referral process um, those cases that need urgent assistance. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Abigail? Uh, uh, Yes, yes, Dr. Bart, yes. Yes, I, I, I just want to uh, add some of the uh, panelists on the, uh, the response in the uh, communities. Uh, one thing that I would suggest is uh, we need to ask the government to include SGBV service in uh, the, as an essential uh, service in their intervention. So during uh, the pandemics, the government uh, have other uh, supporting uh, social service to uh, the community. So the, the first step is uh, making sure that the government include it as an essential service. And then we can do as other uh, panelists has uh, mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Abigail. Please. I mean, I would just, I would, I would, I would definitely echo what the other panelists have said. The first and foremost thing that we, um, you know, have supported here in Fiji, and then of course in some of the other countries in the Pacific, is that gender-based violence, crisis counseling, and shelters are considered essential services. So that means movement can happen during lockdowns and restrictions. And then there have been some approaches that we've seen used where we've had, you know, there's a lot of COVID messages that are getting blasted out on. Um, on all telephones, Digicel, Vodafone, whatever your network is, um, and working through a GBV working group here in Fiji, which is led by the government, the Ministry of Women, in cooperation with the Fiji Women's Crisis Center and UN Women. We had a GBV COVID blast text message that went out that was really promoting the helplines that went to every phone. I think his office said radio, those, those grassroots community networks. We've been working with, um, um, you know, with, with faith leaders, um, and other, you know, community leaders on a, on a communications campaign um, that we hope to get going soon here in Fiji that's about broad prevention, but that is also very much focused on the, you know, the access to services. One thing I would also mention that I think has been very important is focusing on those um, people within the health sector that need, that are coming into constant contact with households during COVID. So, you know, you've got contact tracers. So if there is a case, if you've got contact tracing going on, the fever clinics, we've got a 158 hotline, for example, that was established here in Fiji. So making sure that those people understand basics around gender-based violence and how to refer. And we have worked through the, the GBV working group um, as part of the safety and protection cluster here in Fiji to actually develop short videos, like 20 minute videos that can be shared on Viber or WhatsApp. Um, that those contact tracers and others can use. So I think, as Afa said and others have said, I think there's a lot of improvisation that's happening, which is innovative um, and which will really benefit um, services and access to information wh wh way beyond the COVID crisis. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we've either supported or seen here as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Now we have a string of questions uh, for Marcia from Yvonne. 
who is a very senior journalist from of bangkok post uh, so uh, she wants to know uh, that pacha can you please pick two or three cases that can best shed light on the sexual and gender based violence that occurred during covid 19 pandemic and what was most alarming about those cases how were they handled even if you could share one or two cases if they are there that um, is the first question yes thank you so much i could share three cases okay the one case it um, all of that happened during the late of april it related to the suicide um that three women the first one is on the 29 the woman went to claim that she had been unable to register for the 500 5000 baht assistant on the website and she failed to get the 500 cash relief from the government and she also take the um the red poisons outside of the finance military uh, the military of finance and she was died the second case is a mother of the two children she lost the job she had no income and she cannot buy the meal for her child the child is a 6 month and also 6 years old she was end up with commit suicide the last case that is half broken is happened on the 22nd teenager drawing um the pictures of thailand prime minister payuchan osha i think you can also share i i send the pictures about it she draw this picture this is the prime minister of thailand and she describe about how hard chief that she face it she working more than 12 hours a day but she unable to even buy the meal for her one year old child she felt that she 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 describe that this is the more difficult during drawing this face she is really upset about hard lead of this government and i want to quote this the poor is poorest because the rich is richer the people are dying day by day because a bunch of bad people controlling the uh, power and writing the law in order to make them a good person what you see is not reflect the reality everything i mean in thailand is fake meaning that you know she are uh, really upset about what the government um respond to covid-19 and later on the 28 april she was a uh, commit suicide um she only 19 years old so the all of this case is reflected that, that the women are in a very really difficult situation when we are facing lockdown and we also have the shy and the last thing that the woman will do is end up her life when she had the child as you see now is a lot of women started to end up her life so i think this is really reflected gender based violence during the covid-19 and the government are failed to respond to that um since the since the um late uh april the number of the death because of covid-19 equally with the death of commit suicide meaning that now the number of covid-19 in thailand is zero for two days but the number of people who die because of hunger is rising every day so i think this need to um respond and the government need to have the accountability on this really urgently thank yeah, you i think that's a very important issue of this people are dying of hunger perhaps more mm-hmm. people are dying of hunger and very often that's going on recorded also uh uh ivan's uh, next question is that do you have statistics to highlight the need to better understand and address issues on sexual and gender based violence is there statistics and data which can highlight that need? yes macha unmute yourself please the question is for you only yes uh oh, sorry can you can you repeat please yes uh, ivan wants to know if if there is any statistics or data to highlight the need to better understand and address sexual and gender based violence issues i i can say i wish out to some of the governments uh that they are they have any specific um project or 
that can reflect the mean cure of gender-based violence. The results is they still practice the same way before the COVID-19, meaning that actually what we are worried now is that the government don't have any specific measure um, uh, ensure that the domestic violence is at risk uh, during the COVID-19. But at the same time, what we see more is about the uh, um, CSO who are trying to, you know, providing some services much as much possible, which actually the government also did. I want read some new from BBC reflected that in Thailand we have um, emergency call, uh, the number is 1300, and the BBC tried to reach out to the call for 30 minutes, but it's impossible to access to no one pick up the call, for example. So I think this is the, 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 the thing that the government still not show, not response, I can say. It, has there been, she wants to know, has there been any progress or has there been lack of it uh, in cases involving sexual and gender-based violence in Thailand over the past few years? Has there been some progress or no progress at all? Reflected for as a woman, LGBTIQ who work also in the policy level, try to uh, pushing for you know comprehensive law and policy. We couldn't see any progress during this military government. Okay. Especially okay. if you are you know like for example, women human rights defender have also been attacked from many stakeholder include government as well. I think this is really need to address that the government failed to protect that women and also fail to stop gender-based violence. Okay. Uh, now, her last question perhaps uh, is relevant for all panelists to answer that how better prepared are we to manage this issue in the event of a second outbreak of the viral, of this virus, which is most likely to happen? Are we better prepared to handle the issue? Macha, can you give your comment and maybe the other panelists also then? Because this is not Thailand specific. How are we better prepared to manage the issue of gender and sexual based violence in the case of a second outbreak of the of COVID nineteen? What we reflected that um, if we are uh, positive to um, to address the COVID nineteen as well as the um, sexual and gender based violence, it affect the livelihoods of the women, children, and also marginalized people. And as you see, marginalized people still hunger, still don't access to the food from the government, still not access to the money from the government. I think the next step that the government needs to do is to put the marginalized in the priority. The first priority is sex workers, LGBTIQ, you know, women who face domestic violence. This we really urge the government to show that, you know, I can say, you know, is the pocket when I see that there are dialogue about LGBTIQ, they invited CSO or expertise based on, who are work based on gender-based violence to dialogue with them. But we couldn't see in the past three months, no one are giving any advice to this government to respond to gender-based violence. That's why I see, I couldn't see any pocket, to be honest, and that is unfortunate country. Would the other panelists like to add something to that? That would how yeah, better? I, yeah. Yes, yes, Doctor Bart. Yes. Um, uh, I I think uh, probably for uh, uh, some group or countries or a group within a country, uh, unexpectedly uh, know that uh, during the pandemic this STDV increased. So, um, you know, uh, now we have evidence that uh, during the emergency. Uh, disaster uh, uh, pandemic, uh, this STDV increase. And if there's another second wave or other uh, different uh, pandemic, so we will uh, see the same thing uh, happening. So there's an evidence and the world and uh, our region, uh, the government in each uh, region uh, know and aware of this uh, already. And I hope that this is a good uh, lesson learned for all of the governments and also NGO um, the societies and in the community that this uh, will be uh, happen if there's a uh, disaster, if there's a pandemic uh, coming again and again. So um, I think uh, uh, use this uh, evidence and the lesson learned that we have uh, so far. Uh, as an advocate, uh, we continue to uh, advocate and keep 
um, uh, the governments and other implementers aware of the issue and prepare uh, uh, ourselves in the community, in the governments and the CSOs uh, for uh, a better uh, response to uh, SGBV uh, if there is an, uh, another new wave for another type of uh, pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other two panelists, would you like to add on to that? Um, just quickly from me, um, yes. I don't think there's any excuse not to be ready uh, for a second bout of COVID-19, particularly for my country, Tonga, because we don't have a known case yet, but we have um, gone into lockdown and we have learned from this lockdown. And I think it's, it's a matter of government um, prioritizing and having the political will to listen to the experiences that have um, occurred during COVID-19 and not focus so much just on economic development, but that they need to see that there's a huge gap in social um, the social um, social economics of the country as well and the social impacts that have come out of COVID-19. And um, I think this is the time where we need to get our uh, A into G, as I'd like to say, because we've got this time to get things right. Well, at least better things than they have been uh, working so far. And all the gaps that we've had in terms of gender-based violence um, services in Tonga, we, we have this time to get it right before it hits us again um, and then we're on we're in for the long haul and for bigger and worse impacts so we don't have an excuse we've got this small window of opportunity to get together listen to the experts in this field and get things right thank you uh, Abigail would you like to add something to that I mean, I just 100% agree um, with with the other panelists, and particularly building off of office comments. Um, we we know that in emergencies, um, all kinds of emergencies, gender-based violence um, is exacerbated. In the Pacific, we have um, now a global pandemic, a global health emergency, on top of a context that has cyclical cyclones, on t which is in a broader um, climate change context. And I think that, um, as Afa said, there really is um, no time than right now than to, to truly, you know, recognize um, violence against women and girls already as, as an existing um, public health and human rights issue to understand that it's exacerbated within the global health and, and socioeconomic crisis that we see here in the Pacific, that we see in South, Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, all across the world. And, um, and there really is, I mean, if anything, if there is another wave, we need to see this time right now as our opportunity to act. Um, and I think that um, time is very precious. We can't waste it. Um, and um, yeah, and, and we look, certainly from UN Women's perspective, um, we will continue to do everything we can through the Ending Violence Program that we have here. Um, and I know globally around the world to continue to support civil society um, as well as national governments to, um, you know, to, to really push forward action on gender-based violence. Okay. Uh, we have lots many comments from many viewers uh, thanking the panelists for a very, very inspiring session today, uh, a very inspiring panel discussion. And we have already overshot the time, I think, by more than 30 minutes. But before we close, I would just request Smarcha to give her message uh, for International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biophobia, which is on 17th of May. So just a short take-home message from Marcha. Thank you so much. It's very important moment that we need your solidarity all around the world. Many of our community face it very difficulty, even not, um, not have um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we already face homophobic in the school. You know, we are lack of access to um, the employee. We uh, don't have any law to protect the transgender women. And also, you know, a lot of LBQ women are facing corrective rapes. All of that influenced by homophobia. And the homophobia is really, um, um, you know, situated in our institution, which actually all of you can change that. You know, you can open the space for LGBTIQ and working together, address the needs and, you know, like support LGBTIQ and listen to them. During the COVID-19, many governments have failed to protect us, but 
individually also can protect them. Please stand and you know, like show your solidarity, put the rainbow flag and saying that you know you welcome LGBTI here and we will going through this uh, crisis together and we will win this uh, crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a last comment from Shanti Foundation from Nepal. Again, thanking the panelists for a very enriching session. And with this, we come to the end of today's dialogue. Our sincere thanks to our panelists. I think there have been uh, too many thank yous pouring in for all of you. And also to our participants for their invaluable contribution to today's discussions. Friends, in this eighth episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, we were listening to Dr. Chivon Var from Cambodia, Abigail from Fiji, Ofa from uh, Tonga, and Macha Hornin from Thailand. APCR SHR 10 Dialogues is a special series of online interviews with leaders from Asia Pacific on the theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific, the 2030 SDGs vision and 2020 realities. And they are co-hosted by APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Thanks for listening and stay safe and stay healthy and bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.